For turning now to our top story, the bombings in Boston. The blast on Monday, they killed three people and wounded 176. The FBI now heading up the investigation, trying to figure out how this happened. Our investigation certainly will not be confined very likely to the city limits of Boston. Uh, it would extend out to the eastern Massachusetts area. This will be a worldwide investigation. We will take, go where the evidence and the leads take us. We will go to the ends of the earth to identify the subject or subjects who are responsible for this uh, d uh, despicable crime, and we will do everything we can to bring them to justice. Well, the search for clues, that's got to be extensive. The crime scene, what, what is it, 12 blocks long? Yeah, it's, Yeah, it's crazy. Now, let's bring in a CNN analyst and former assistant Homeland Security Secretary Juliet Kayyem. Juliet, police fanning out, seeing airports, Amtrak stations uh, and the like. What, what is it that they're going to be looking for in these early hours? Well, they're, they're actually trying to engage a lot of the public who may be um, unwitting sort of witnesses to what happened. There is a, a big suspicion that the perpetrator or perpetrators of this were probably on site. And the reason for that is there's been no disclosure of a cellular detonation. So you may, so people may have pictures of someone walking into the marathon area and then four seconds later someone else has a picture of that same person. And so we're everyone's looking for pictures. So both at Logan and at Amtrak, they're trying to engage uh, the people leaving town now. We have a, about 75,000 people leaving town today uh, to try to get them to look at their iPhones. So that's really important. Just about, you know, 200 feet away from me is the finish line. And so they are now calling through all of that. That's a forensic site. And that may lead to materials or evidence related to both the bomb um, and then any sharp meal or anything else that was left over that might have fingerprints. Uh, Juliet, it's hard for people to imagine here, but, you know, trying to secure a marathon like this, I mean, a lot of times right. what ends up happening is that you've got well-wishers, family members who want to come back, run with you right. the last mile or two. I mean, this is a very difficult situation. How on earth are, going, are they going to figure out who was in the spot there at the time? And then all these people with backpacks, I mean, lots of people have backpacks. Right. I mean, how do they sort all that out? That's exactly right. So, so the reason why we heard about so many possible explosives yesterday was because those were all backpacks. Anyone who's run a marathon or knows a marathon, people are throwing bags everywhere. They're exhausted. They're looking for their family members. So that's the first thing. Um, so what they did is they had to make sure none of those were explosives. So now they're going through whatever may be, whatever materials may still be here. It is a lot. And I will tell you, this marathon will happen next year. It will be different. The finish line will probably be different. I was head of Homeland Security for the state. This was a big part of our of our planning the marathon the problem is of course that the finish line as you said is very open and you want it to be open people are running into their family members arms it's very joyous there'll probably be more precautions at the finish line but no one should believe that marathons can ever be safe it is uh, 52 I'm doing my math wrong but it's 26 times two uh, miles of spectators on both sides of the road and uh, and you just can't make them perfectly safe so you just have procedures and processes in place to ensure that people are looking out for for bad things happening and that you, the first responders know what to do if something does. You've, you've, you've got uh, great insight here, so share some of it with us, yeah. if you will. The president is meeting with cabinet members, Homeland Security today. Right. Uh, from your perspective, set the scene for us. What, what, what goes on in a meeting like that? What's the atmosphere going to be like? Well, so this, there's been uh, probably hundreds of meetings already so far because each agency is going to have a piece of this depending on if it's foreign or domestic. So you have the NCTC, National Counterterrorism Center, CIA, all of these intelligence agencies looking for potential uh, threat streams, people claiming that they did it on the Internet. Um, they're doing their thing. They then, uh, and then the, you have the domestic side. People, the FBI has a big domestic role, the Department of Homeland Security, where I used to work, Department of Justice. You maybe even have people involved at transportation. And then they all meet at the cabinet secretaries and their deputies meet, depending on what size meeting, with the president to say, here's where we are now. The president convenes them to both show that he is leading this, which I think is important. People, the American public needs to see it. Also to make sure that the government is uh, talking in one voice. It is very important right now that you don't have cabinet members going off saying their own thing. You, we want to be on message with what the president's message is, which is 
uh, as he said just about an hour ago, the, the investigation is going to take longer than the response. Um, and so all this speculation about an interview here or a, a, a woman, a Saudi woman there, um, is really just that speculation. So that's what's going. And then he, he directs it. He has, he's got his counterterrorism team there. And, and, and Julia, real, real quick here, I know, uh, you know the president is trying to project a sense of confidence at the same time as they are cautious as well. Is there anything that you have seen that either indicates whether it's domestic or foreign terrorism? Anything? Uh. So, I mean, there's a, uh, my gut is telling me domestic, but I could very well prove wrong. We mostly because the foreign intelligence is clearly not going to be disclosed. There's almost no way that a lot of that stuff is not going to trickle out right now. Where the domestic stuff is really just from the evidence at the scene. These now appear to be unsophisticated <laughs> bombs. The Boston Marathon, even though it's it, it has a global invite list, it really is a local event. No one has taken uh, credit for this. That's really uh, an attribute of really a criminal or domestic criminal and uh, and so that's just sort of you know that's just speculation of having been in the field but I just want to say I I don't know what I don't know so I want to you know I think it's important that both sides of it the foreign and the domestic go uh, and and investigate and and uh, and lead in the direction where the evidence is rather than some speculation beforehand that it's one thing or, or the other absolutely mm. smart approach thank you Julie I appreciate that Great insight. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, here's, a, here's an interesting sidebar to Sports Illustrated's Boston Marathon issue hit the stands today. And the man on the cover there, you see, is 78-year-old Bill Ifrig. Uh, he was actually nearing the finish line when the first bomb went off, exploded. Uh, he told Pierce Morgan that the shock waves from the blast took him out. There's a tremendous explosion. Sound like a bomb went off right next to me, and that uh, shock waves just hit my whole body, and my my legs just started jittering around. I I knew I was going down. So that is that is the guy we have been watching. Yeah, that is the piece of video, that critical piece of video where you see him just crumble mm -hmm. from the impact. Yeah, he said he felt something on his leg too, but it was nothing major. It was just a bit of a nick of uh, obviously a piece of debris or something like that. But yeah, just getting literally knocked over. And you're going to hear more from him, by the way, in the next hour. And of course, the Boston bombing, it has actually London on edge now. That is because that city is now preparing for its own marathon this weekend. We're going to go live to London next to find out what kind of security is actually being put in place there. as the world reacts to yesterday's uh, bombing in horror in Boston. Here's a look at how some of the newspapers uh, handled the story. This is from around the world now. Yeah, in Canada, for starters, the Montreal Gazette running a front-page picture of the chaos at the finish line. You see it there. Same with Germany's Bild newspaper, which ran the headline of Terror at Marathon. And in the UK, the Times uh, newspaper simply said, bombs bring carnage to end of Boston Marathon. Well, we're going to go to London. That is where Max Foster is joining us live. Uh, so, Max, we just saw the cover of the Times of London. And uh, we've also heard, I understand, from the British Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister. Um, how are they expressing either their shock or condolences? Well, they're very quick to respond. I mean, the Im these images really have been shocking, as you say, around the world, playing and playing on the TV screens here as we get more and more through from the US, uh, from David Cameron. The scenes from Boston are shocking and horrific. Also, with those who've been affected, very similar comments from William Hague, the Foreign Secretary. Also, I know that the Queen has sent a personal message to President Obama. They haven't told us what's in that. Maybe he will release that later on, or the White House will. Uh, but certainly a real, real sense of sympathy coming from here, the UK, to what we've seen unfold in the US. Mm. Yeah, Max, uh, of course, we, as we said before, the London Marathon this weekend, uh, I know there's been statements made about security. Obviously, that, that would be a concern. What are they saying? What's interesting is that um, the head of the London Marathon, which is on Sunday, came out almost straight away saying this event will still carry on. Some people thinking that was too sudden, but actually it was a sign of defiance, and that's been, really been reflected in a lot of the <coughs> runners today as well, saying we are more determined to run in this race on Sunday in solidarity uh, for Boston. Interesting, a real campaign kicked off today on Twitter. It's called Hands on Hearts, and it's a campaign to get the runners, uh, as they cross the finish line on Sunday, to put their hands across their hearts in solidarity for Boston. I think you're going to see a lot of that on 
on Sunday. Also, we've just heard uh, from the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, the head of the London Police, saying there will be an increased uh, set of search officers coming out on the streets because of Boston on Sunday. Also, uh, a lot more police ba basically out on the street more searches, adding that the force is taking any potential link between Boston and London very seriously, but they haven't got any evidence that anything might happen on Sunday so far. All right, Max Foster in London, thanks so much. And of course, they'll be uh, also looking at the funeral of Margaret Thatcher, which is on Wednesday as well. So Absolutely that's high thing. security. I want to go to Joe Johns. He's got some breaking news, some updated information on mm. uh, the uh, potential uh, timing device on one of these bombs. Um, Joe, what are you learning? Well, uh, that's the gist of it, Suzanne. Uh, a law enforcement official telling CNN that it is likely but not certain that a timing device attached to an explosive is uh, what caused this tragedy in Boston. Now, this was in response to a question that I asked uh, as to whether this explosion may have been caused by uh, some type of an arrangement where a cell phone was used. And the source saying it was likely but not certain that it was a timing device uh, that caused the bomb to explode. Uh, investigators, of course, uh, sifting through all the evidence that has already uh, been uh, picked up there uh, on the street in Boston uh, certainly would include debris of any type of device that was used in this explosion. So um, our information, once again, Suzanne, it was likely a timing device as opposed uh, to a cellular phone. Suzanne? And Joe, do you know from your source, do they tell you what the significance of that is, uh, whether or not it is a timing device that's used or, or a cell phone? Because we know so many people in that area, I'm sure, had cell phones, were carrying cell phones to, just to communicate to their loved ones at the finish line or if they were at a coffee shop nearby. Uh, does it make a big difference here? Well, um, if it's accurate, what it does point to, at least a little bit, is a, a question about the sophistication of the device uh, that may have been used. So uh, if you know that it was a timing device, then you know they were not uh, able to arrange uh, to trigger all of this uh, by cellular telephone. It doesn't tell you much more than that. And again, we've said uh, all day yesterday and part of today that this uh, device was uh, apparently low explosive. It was also not that sophisticated. It's been likened, uh, at least one of these devices has been likened to uh, a gussied up pipe bomb, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what we know is uh, it was a timing device that's uh, sort of old school as opposed to new school when it comes to setting off an explosion on a city street. All right, Joe, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, and, the, and the tragedy of the times is that it, it's not that hard to build a bomb, you know. And, then, and, and uh, people were so, I was talking to somebody earlier who was telling me the white smoke could be an indicator too. Military-grade explosive will put out a black or darkened smoke and uh, that this points more to something homegrown, whether it's fertilizer or, or something like, you know, peroxide, it acetone like peroxide. It sounds like a crude device. It's, yeah, and, and sadly, you can go online and work it out yourself. It's, it's tragically simple and uh, it doesn't have to be high tech. To, and as we heard earlier, in a pressure cooker, bang, that magnifies the, the explosion as well. Yeah, but with not very much, yeah. And up next, we're actually going to speak to the husband of the doctor who declared the eight-year-old Martin Richard mm. passed away, died in that explosion. Can you imagine?